as you know, Protestants, we say, you know, we believe that we hold to the Word of God, but as Catholics say, we say Amen, but it's a bigger scope. So this is kind of like the bigger scope of you know the Word of God and, and all its factors and what it's doing in the world and how that culminates in Jesus Christ as finally the Word made flesh, and how this has continued on into the Eucharist. So just another kind of recap. So basically, I also want to recap a little bit of Father's talk yesterday, uh, last week or two weeks ago. I thought there was a couple things I could I would have liked to personally add to it. And to really understand, you know, this, I mean, that's the incarnation is just, you know, you know, when Father was saying in his talk, you know, the incarnation, it's a mystery for, for sure. And, and, and as he emphasized, you know, it's just because it's a mystery doesn't mean it's unintelligible or unrational or unreasonable. And so, you know, picture's always good <laughs> to my little stick figures here to kind of illustrate the, the importance of, of, you know, somebody, I think somebody asked me one time, you know, why is Jesus so important, you know, in, the, in our faith? You know, how can we say that, you know, we need to believe in Jesus to go to heaven? That was, that, that was the essence of the question, which it's a very good and valid question because, you know, you don't want to feel like you're dismissing other people because they don't believe in Jesus. But as we'll get, in, as we'll get into tonight, kind of especially in his aspect of the Eucharist and how he gives himself to us in the Eucharist and what that actually does for us as human beings to our very bodies and souls, it will hopefully, you know, really answer that question, but because, you know, when we say that, when we profess that we believe that Jesus is both God and man, we're, you know, we're professing that he did that for a reason. So here it kind of illustrates, you know, in origin, what they call original justice in the garden, you know, you have, a, most people have heard of original sin, but there's a kind of a uh, balanced uh, term that's not so often used as original justice, it's the state of Adam and Eve before the fall, and so I have him in all little golden boy here, and then God, you know, I have him more clear, so he's, you know, he's really unseen, so, but you got to illustrate him somehow, and you, know, you see the light coming from his eyes, that's to indicate that he's God, and then of course the sin, you see that little break of, you, of friendship, you got the friendship, the little snap of friendship, and then he's all red, because he's all sin, and, but then the, then the kind of the, how Jesus Christ heals that as becoming this God entering human flesh and basically sanctifying it. So that's why it's important to believe in Jesus because once you believe in Jesus and you follow him, you receive the grace that he has for us in, this, in the sacraments, you know, it's, you know, that healing importance. And so here I have this little guy, it's supposed to be his God and man. So, so, uh, Here's a couple of really good quotes to kind of help understand this idea. And we'll really talk about it later on. It's, it's a, uh, just to give you a little heads up, the term is called theosis. It's very important. Uh, it's a technical, you know, theological term. But the, some of the little sayings that the fathers would use to kind of, you know, help people understand. Uh, divinity took on humanity so that humanity may take on divinity. Or, or in other words, it's basically heal that break. Uh, and then they would all say, that which has not been healed, or not, that which has not been assumed has not been healed. So for example, I think I, and when I was watching Father's video, I heard somebody ask in the background uh, if Jesus had a human soul. And you know, in his, in his uh, PowerPoint, he showed that you know, Jesus had everything that was human and then everything that was divine. Because in order to heal, like heal the, 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 the sinful soul, human soul, or to heal the, the dying human body, in order to heal the sinful mind, he had to take that on so that he could, you know, through his grace, that he could transform that for us as Christians. So kind of how this all kind of comes to a head in the Eucharist, uh, divine revelation. Uh, oh, just, so just basically uh, kind of laying out just, just the promises, you know, how everything was coming to a head. Uh, the promise to Adam and Eve of a Redeemer the development of the scripture tradition. Jesus finally reveals himself, and then within the church, he is uh, again, you know, incarnate through the church. So his incarnation is extending in through time and space. And so, Jesus and the Eucharist are understood, well, as will really unfold tonight, you know, both understood as the presence of Christ. You know, Emmanuel, God with us, as the New Testament says. So what the Eucharist is, 
These are just a couple of uh, quotes from the uh, Catechism. And then tonight I'm going to really be doing a lot of focusing on Scripture, just for the very sake that, you know, it's one of those, you know, tonight's really, a, you know, the previous talks, we, we have a lot of agreement with, you know, separated brothers and sisters, brothers and brothers and sisters, but this is one of those really big ones, of course. So I'll, I'll really do a lot of focusing in on uh, Scripture, the Scriptural roots, but here's a couple, just kind of a definitional, uh, from the Catechism, you know, that official statement. The Eucharist is the memorial of Christ's Passover. So we'll get into that, how the Passover was related to Christ and the Eucharist. Making present of the sacramental offering of his unique sacrifice in the liturgy of the church, which is his body. Because it is a memorial of Christ's Passover, the Eucharist is also a sacrifice. The sacrificial character of the Eucharist is manifest in the very words of the institution. This is my body which is given for you, and this is my... Uh, Cup is my blood poured out for you in the new, of the new, for the new covenant. The Eucharist, in the Eucharist, Christ gives us the very body which he gave up for us on the cross, the very blood he, which he poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And some of those quotes are like official, you know, older church documents or certain saints, and maybe, you know, kind of making these clarifications. The Eucharist is thus a sacrifice because it represents or, or makes present the sacrifice of the cross because it is a memorial and because it applies the fruits. So like I said a few weeks ago, it's really inappropriate for us to kind of dichotomize or make this division between the Last Supper and the cross because the two, as we'll really unpack tonight again in talking about the different the cups of the Passover, it's all one, one long service, if you will. The Eucharist is, and then the final quote from the Catechism, the CCC means Catechism of the Catholic Church, and then it's paragraph number. In the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord. So see, there's that body and blood, the soul that's, you know, there for, to heal our, our flesh and our souls. They're both all present. Uh, therefore, whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained. And this presence is called real, the real presence, by which is not intended to exclude any other types of presence as if they could be real also, but because it is, it is the presence of the full sense, substantially holy. Oh, so it's, <laughs> thus the Eucharist is, and then if you notice my little subtitle of the talk tonight, the source and some of the Christian life, all, all other sacraments basically they're saying, everything else that we'll talk about, everything that's, that we ever talk or learn about, all flows towards the Eucharist in some respect. Because if we believe that, you know, our, the, our, the foundation of our Christian faith is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has made himself, you know, really and substantially present for us still within the church. You know, everything else, you know, moves towards Christ, moves towards the Eucharist. The two being one and the same. So here's just a couple of common names that we, we also use for the Eucharist. Just to, they have, you know, basically for their own a little emphasis that they, you know, make. So for example, the, the, the very term itself, I think I mentioned this before, the Eucharist means thanksgiving. And so, you know, in certain uh, biblical passages in the New Testament, you'll, you'll read, uh, he took the bread, broke it, and gave thanks. So he's saying, so if you read in the Greek, he'd say, he broke it and gave eucharistia, which is the, the Greek term for eucharist. So it, it is a biblical term it's in, in, in and of itself. You know, so we give thanks, it's emphasizing our thanks to God for our salvation, essentially. The Lord's Supper, you know, emphasizing that it was started by Christ. The real presence, you know, i.e. Jesus, uh, the Blessed Sacrament, you know, our source of grace, Holy Communion, our you know, union with God. <clears throat> okay, and then this is something that really rocked my world when I was coming to the church and learning all this stuff 10 years ago, to, to discover, and we'll really go over this a little bit when we discuss the uh, early church fathers, but for the first thousand years, the, the doctrine of the real presence was not questioned until this fellow called Baron Garris of Tours, Tours, France. This French guy started, eh, you know, is this, is this really, really going on or something like that? I don't, I don't know what was in his mind, but, but yeah, that's, you know, kind of a significant thing that, you know, historically, the concept of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, you know, so we'll discuss that later as well, you know, why did people start losing faith in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist? So what the Eucharist is not, the Eucharist is not merely a symbol, and this, of course, is the biggest, you know, our biggest, you know, Protestant brother and sister's notion of what the Eucharist is. But that's really historically a relatively new notion, started by uh, Zwingli, 
which kind of funny enough is Zwingli, he wasn't one of the uh, more prominent of the reformers, you know, like Luther or Calvin or King Henry VIII, but he was very influential, of course, and, and his, his understanding of uh, the Eucharist in Protestant theology has been, been the most prominent, that it's just a symbol, but, you know, it's only a, you know, a, like a 450-year-old idea, really, versus the real presence, you know, going back to the beginning, as we'll see later. It's not, uh, Christ is not present alongside the bread. That was Luther's idea. What they, the term is consubstantial. His idea was that you have the bread one. See, for some reason, he couldn't really, he didn't have the faith for whatever reason to really say that, you know, it fully transformed into the bread and wine, I suppose, because, you know, it's, it is a, it takes a lot of faith to believe that, of course, you know, but if we understand the roots of it, it's, you know, we can come to understand it, but it takes faith, obviously, but probably because, you know, it's, it still tastes like bread, still tastes like wine. But, you know, as we'll talk, uh, <clears throat> as, we, as we say in theology, those are what they refer to as the accidents. So the accidents are not transformed because, I mean, that would really probably rock our world. You know, every time you go to Mass, I'll say if it transformed the blood. And, you know, so, but that misses the point. You know, that's not really the point of what the Eucharist is. It's not the point that we're really supposed to eat flesh and blood. But it's uh, the point that Christ is giving himself to us in a, you know, digestible way, so to speak. And the last, it's not spiritually present. This is more of the Presbyterian, you know, the John Calvin idea is that it's spiritually present for those who have faith to believe. You know, the, the, the truly elect, you know, as Calvin would talk about, his famous favorite doctrine of election. So he, his idea was that it was, it's, he, Christ really comes to those who, you know, are, are true believers who have truly accepted him. So common misconceptions. We are not receiving meat and blood. So this is the kind of thing. This is now that misses the point. We're not receiving the meat and blood, but we're rec receiving the glorified presence of Christ. Uh, we do not crucify. So that's one of the ideas, you know, because the Book of Hebrews says that Christ gave Himself to us as you know one-time sacrifice, you know, and then so the, so Protestants would say, so see, there's only one sacrifice. You guys call this the sacrifice of the Mass, but that, like I said, this is the point that the Eucharist, the, the, you know, the Mass. Or, uh, you know, the Lord's Supper, you know, when he first instituted it, it's not separate from that sacrifice. It's united. So every Mass is spiritually, like we'll talk about, like, like in the Passover, you know, it's spiritually connected to, it's spiritually united with the cross. So every Mass is united with the cross. So we say, so as Catholics, we say amen to what Hebrews, the book of Hebrews says, you know, we believe it's only one sacrifice. And so we're not re-sacrificing. It's, as we said on a previous slide, it's, uh, representing, making present the sacrifice of the cross. And we don't worship a cracker. That's kind of more of a sarcastic thing that some, said, some people say. It's not really a cracker. Okay, now we get into the piece of the talk. Old Testament prophecies and New Testament fulfillments. So recall what I said about typology of several weeks ago, and I just kind of recapped at the beginning. You know, typology is, you know, Symbols, Old Testament symbols, like you know, uh, like uh, Isaac. You know, when Abraham took Isaac up the hill. You know, at that point, you know, Isaac became a type of Christ. Or even right, right in the Book of Genesis, you know, Cain slew Abel. You know, Abel was the righteous son. You know, the innocent, you know, guy. And then you know, he's the, but he was the victim of his brethren. You know, just like Jesus is the vic became the vic victim of his brethren. You know. Uh, a symbol, so a symbol is, it cannot, it's, it would make sense for a symbol to be the fulfillment of another symbol. So that's kind of right there, you know, why it's kind of kooky to call, you know, the Eucharist it's another symbol of an Old Testament symbol. So, yeah, so, so there's other symbolic images like the lambs, manas, and the, it's a, the todah, it's a Jewish uh, ceremony we'll talk about in a minute. So one of the first, the first one, the uh, Eucharistic President's uh, prophecy, excuse me, of Melchizedek. I, you probably, if you're raised in a good Christian family, you've heard of Melchizedek and what his old deal was. And so, you know, to, to this, most of us understand and agree that Melchizedek, he was, a, he was a, he was the king of Salem, the prophet, the priest king of Salem, which later became Jerusalem. So it's, it's ancient Jerusalem before it was Jerusalem. And he came and blessed Abraham. And he, in his blessing, he did a blessing, a service of bread and wine. And so, of course, uh, the bread and wine being the prefigurement and, of, and, you know, the, and this priest king being the prefigurement of Christ and the Eucharist. And so a couple of the two main passages from Scripture, Genesis 14 and Psalm 110. 
And so Psalm 110 is that prophecy of his anointed one, of the one from who will come from David, that he will be uh, in the line of Melchizedek, a priest like Melchizedek. Of um, part of, if, if you don't know, I'm sorry, if you don't know who Melchizedek was, he's kind of a uh, mi uh, mystical figure of unknown origin, and uh, yeah, so so it's kind of also kind of related to Christ. You know, he's of unknown origin in the respect that he's not from you know his no natural parents that we knew. So Jesus is the new Melchizedek, and then Hebrews five is, tells us about that. You know how how Christ be, uh, he brings together these two passages in, of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Melchizedek was the priest king of Salem. Uh, Christ is now the priest king. Melchizedek was not a Levite. Oh, that's another point I was going to come up bring. Uh, nor was Jesus. And so you know Jesus reestablished. Re you know you know re re recall we mentioned a couple weeks ago that the priesthood was originally meant for all Jewish men. But then because of the golden calf incident, you know, the, it went to the Levites because they were the only remained faithful tribe in that respect. And so, but so now Jesus reopened it up to all, all Christian men, you know, who are able, who are called. Another Old Testament prophecy is the Passover lamb. Many of us know, are familiar with the, that uh, relationship. The book of Exodus lays out the details of how to, you know, Hold the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. Three necessary elements of the Passover were uh, made mandatory. This you slaughter an unblemished lamb, spread the blood on the doorpost, and eat its flesh, which, in, the, in similar respect to Christ, he is now the Lamb of God uh, his, with his blood being shed for us, and we eat the, eat the lamb, the sacrifice, but again, of course, in a glorified fashion, you know. Uh, so a couple uh, verses, just, you know, many of us know the Lamb of God references in Scripture. Okay, then uh, another major one, of course, that many of us are probably familiar with is the manna. When the Jews, <coughs> excuse me, when the Jews came out of Egypt, and, you know, the, the Exodus God provided for them because, you know, they were starving, you know, they were in a, in a wasteland. So the you know, their little, little cakes fell down from heaven, and they baked them into little uh, bread loaves. And then, then Jew, Jesus is the true manna. You know, he gives the. And we'll really go go into this because you know that's one of those controversial uh, parts of scripture. You know, John six. You know, people try to explain that as symbolic, but uh, Jesus basically says, "I am the bread of life." You know, he's kind of alluding to what he will later be teaching, or la later be giving, but he kind of sets up his Eucharistic teaching before he gives it at the Last Supper. For some reason this is cutting off the bottom line, but it's just a passage from the book of Revelation. Okay, and then the, the most, a lot of us don't know about this, I didn't learn about this several years ago as well, it's kind of very interesting, once you really dig into Jewish tradition and culture, and the, those, the different sacrifices that they were that God commanded them to, eat, uh, to to practice in the book of Leviticus. The todah, which is uh, just basically a Hebrew word that means, I think it, be, it means a peace. Or, uh, and it was, a, a, yeah, Thanksgiving, it was a Thanksgiving sacrifice. Yeah, that's where, you know, so it's kind of like Eucharistic, you know, the word Thanksgiving meaning Eucharistic. Eucharistic. So it's a peace offering in Thanksgiving for one's salvation, and just the pastors in Leviticus and Numbers, how it was, you know, commanded to be done. Uh, this is the only offering in which the offerer shared, you know, because all the other ones, they, you know, they would just bring up their bowls or whatever, and it would be burned up, or the, only the priests were allowed to, you know, partake of it. But in this one, the people were actually here allowed to, and actually to share it and had the bread and wine with it, you know, symbolizing its sacrificial nature. And of course, it foreshadows our peace with Christ. Prophecy of Malachi. So Christ is the giver of the new Torah. And this is a really cool passage that I was, as a Protestant boy, I don't recall. But uh, he says, From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations. Incense offerings are made to my name everywhere for a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. 
So that's pretty, very, pretty significant. Basically, you know, the Jews had a lot of problems with, you know, and rightly so because they were pagan at the time. But the Jews had a really, you know, negative sentiment towards, you know, what the nations is just, you know, a way of saying the Gentiles, you know, or not the non-Jews. So, so basically, he's setting up that he's going to be eventually, you know, doing God will eventually be doing something with the Gentiles. Obviously, if they're going to be doing a having a pure offering and pure sacrifice to the God of the Jews. So something radical is obviously going to happen. They're expecting. So it's a, uh, among the nations a pure offering offer everywhere, not just in the temple. Now this is this is BC, so this is before you know the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So and this is uh, Matt, what a, what a, another kind of significant side note of this being like one of the final biblical prophecies as well, because the book of Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. The last prophetic book, I should say, anyways. So the Eucharist in the New Testament. So they look, uh, uh, a lot of the, what I'll talk about, I'll really focus in on John's Gospel, per se, uh, because it's very, uh, it's un biblical scholars recognize that it's very sacramental, or it very much uses physical, material, uh, Imagery in order to convey the message of salvation. So, so you know, the biblical say call it the sacramental gospel as this little sign of somebody's you know CD they came up with. So, you know, every aspect of every sacrament is mentioned within the Book of John, but the Eucharist and baptism are really two of the main uh, emphases of the Gospel of John. Because they're really, you know, obviously there are the major, the two major sacraments of initiation, you know. Uh, confirmation is understood as being united to uh, to the baptism. As I might have said before that uh, uh, the Eastern Orthodox, for example, still, you know, administer uh, confirmation to babies when they're baptized as well. Understanding that uh, the con we understand, we'll talk about this later in a different talk, of course, but understanding that Confirmation is the seal of our baptism, as they say. So baptism and eu Eucharist are really the two, you know, baptism cleanses, and then the Eucharist for, throughout the Christian life sustains. So some of the, uh, really to kind of preparing the way for this, um, to really grasp and to really build our faith, you know, Jesus, uh, John really records, emphasizes the things that, you know, really help us understand how Jesus can eventually give us his body and blood and Eucharist. So, for example, in, at the, the very first, Jesus opens his public ministry according to the Gospel of John uh, with his, what, his miracle at the, the wedding in Cana, where he transforms, you know, he trans, he does it, you know, this way he actually transforms the, the, uh, the accidents, as I said last time, so that they would, you know, not think they're just drinking, you know, clear uh, wine, but anyways... So he actually transforms, transubstantiates, if you will, the water into wine. And you know, as the, you know, having the power of the Son of God Almighty obviously can do that. And then the next major aspect of the Eucharist, you know, preparing us for the Eucharist, is the multi at the beginning of the Gospel of John, the, the multiplication of loaves and fishes. And for uh, what's kind of significant in you know, the interpretation, how to understand this passage. You know, as you may know, uh, numbers are very significant. Every number for a Jew from one to, you know, th a thousand has a significant number. Has a significant, well, not everyone, but the major, well, like one through twelve, I think, has significance for Jews. And then the other big numbers, like a thousand just means, you know, a multitude. Just means an, an unknowable lot. So, so for example, the, the five loaves and two fishes... You know, signify, you know, and then they also, adding numbers together, what really meant something for them, you know. So, for example, like, we'll talk about, I'll talk about later, you know, how uh, in the book of Revelation, I'll talk about this in a different talk, but the, for adding the number six, six up, six up, you know, if he says it means somebody's name, which when you add up the emperor Nero of his time, he's re making a reference to, you know, Nero as the Antichrist. And so, even adding numbers meant something. So, so the kind of, there's even just, really beautiful subtleties to, you know, the Gospel of John in this respect. You know, the sub number seven meaning perfection, in case you can't read it. 
Jesus teaching, his te actually gives his teaching. Te so focusing on his teaching of the Eucharist, a couple uh, points for context. And so I was, I was going to originally have him read the whole thing. I'm like, ah, it's too long. But if you understand, if you, can, you can go read it yourselves. Uh, but a couple points for a good interpretation. Uh, he said he refers to himself as the bread of heaven. Of course, we know, you know he's making that allusion to the Old Testament, the manna being that bread that fell from heaven, uh, miraculous. Oh, and then uh, for the uh, so for the Jews, uh, uh, the manna thought was thought to have been hidden by Jeremiah. Okay, if you know your Old Testament very well, uh, in the Ark of the Covenant was held the the the, the, the priestly. Uh, staff of Aaron, uh, and then the, the Ten Commandments, and then the manna in the jar. The stuff did not dissolve. And it, was a, it was a miraculous thing, of course, to be preserved. And so the prophet Jeremiah took it off. He, he hid the ark from, for safety. And so the, 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 pro, the prophetic idea was that the, the, uh, the ark was going to be rediscovered, you know, and then all the, the manna would return. Well, that was prophetic in respect in the respect that as Father Matt, our Father Daniel discussed, Mary is understood as the new Ark of the Covenant in her belly. You know, she's a, a significant, we will understand why she's such a significant woman. In her belly was contained the Ark. You know, you know, in Christ we say that uh, Christ is our priest, prophet, and king. You know, so in her, she, so what was in the Ark of the Covenant, you know, represented the priest, prophet, and king. The, the priesthood of Aaron was represented by the staff. Uh, the prophetic or the, the, the teaching, the law, was in the, in the ark. And then uh, the kingliness, the uh, providing for, one's, for your, one's people, you know, that was the role of the king, to provide for his people, to, you know, their safety and their, you know, preservation. So the manna represented the kingship. So within her was priest, prophet, king, all contained into one, you know, the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, and then another important part is understand kind of like the, the language of, the, it's you know, like we said in the previous talk. You know, it's, it's very important, obviously, to understand like biblical languages to do some solid interpretation. And so th this was kind of you know enlightening to me when I was learning this stuff as well. That in Greek, the word that they use is very uh, significant in what it means in its context. It's the verb used in Greek is uh, of human eating, but uh, not of human eating, but of animal eating, to mean, meaning to munch or to gnaw. This may, this may be part of John's emphasis on the reality of the flesh and blood of Jesus. But the, the same verb eventually became ordinary Greek, meaning just to eat in general. But, but there's a significance of, of this kind of carnal understanding that you're actually eating, like, like the animals, eating the flesh, you know, as they would t you know, tear on other animals. But it's just kind of gory, but it, it's, you know, it's how they made their emphasis back then. And so, so of course, as if we're familiar with John six, you know, they said they eventually many of them said this is a hard teaching. Who can stand it? You know, this guy's actually. And so, so part of the part of the interpretation is that, as just know the word to help us understand it, the word eat in the context when they heard it, they took it as literally because thus they walked away. And as some Catholic apologists will you know point out. If, if Jesus was really speaking symbolically, he would have been morally obligated to say, and they misunderstood, just misunderstood what he meant. And he was really, he would be more morally obligated to say, hey, you misunderstood. You know, don't walk away from me based on a misunderstanding. You mistakenly thought I was being, lit, uh, being literal. No, I was, you know, so he, he actually meant what he said. And when, he, and when they walked away, he turned to his apostles and said, are you going to leave me also? But, you know, but for those who did, you know, who did persevere in faith, you know, like Peter says, you have the words of eternal life, you know, where else are we to go? So, but for those who did persevere, you know, the apostles and, you know, those throughout the centuries who understand, you know, it's, it's easier for us to believe, actually, versus hearing, you know, first time, first hand, you know, when he's given this teaching, you know, because we now understand that what he meant was, you know, he's, he took the Eucharist. So it's, it's easier for us to digest, you know, to, to make a pun. Okay, so this is an interesting side note. Uh, are, is, are any of you familiar with uh, Catholic Answers? It's a, a radio program. It's, not, it's, not, it's fantastic. If you've got time in the evenings between 5 o'clock and 7, there's two shows from 5 to 6 and 6 to 7, and they field questions. You know, non-Catholics will often call in and say, 
why do you Catholics believe, you know, this about the Eucharist or this about Mary? And these guys are just brilliant, you know, they just, you know, know the ins and outs of every, you know, Catholic teaching, so they're very good uh, at answering. But anyways, last night somebody called in and said that he had heard a statistic saying that uh, many uh, people who go to the RCIA program, you know, eventually within after a year, you know, the retention rate drops off, you know, so, you know a lot of them don't come back for whatever reason, you know, personal reasons, personal hang-ups. Or and then, you know, over a couple of years, you know, more people just maybe apathy, just, ah, I don't feel like it anymore, I don't feel like going every weekend. So, so I wanted to, I thought it was kind of, you know, useful information for me to know that, because as a brand new DRE, you know, I don't want to lose you guys. And uh, so, so I just want to make the emphasis, you know, and this, and it's kind of uh, uniquely important, obviously, to this class, when we understand you know, the importance of the Eucharist as being the source, you know, uh, the source and summit of the Christian life. You know, you know, it's you know, it's it's the heart of Christianity that's been lost for you know 500 years in certain groups. And you guys, you know, as coming back to the church, kind of you guys being kind of symbolic uh, uh, signs of you know healing those divisions of you of you know breaks of unity. You know, you're rediscovering you know classical Christianity and the heart of classical Christianity being the Eucharist. So, you know, of course, in the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox, too, because they're historically, you know, they go back all the way to the beginning. You know, they have apostolic succession, and they have the priesthood who can actually, you know, conf to uh, confer the, the great, uh, what's the, conf confect the Eucharist. So, they're there as well, but that's more of an uh, ethnicity thing. And then, I just found this picture on the internet I thought was rather interesting. As some, some of you might know, uh, uh, what is it? Was it Michelangelo who did the, uh, the famous Last Supper at sitting at a table, which Jews would not have had tables and chairs. So you know, of course, he was you know uh, doing art according to his own cultural mindset. But this is kind of neat because I did a in my undergraduate one of my undergraduate classes in theology, we did an actual Passover meal, and Father Guy actually has laying down on the mats around this little tables little kind of slightly elevated areas for eating and drinking. And so the, 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 the internet said, you know, this is a more of an accurate depiction of what the Last Supper would have looked like, you know, versus all those other ones of, you know, there's many sense of them sitting at tables, but this is more accurate than kind of leaning, lounging. You got John passed out there. As, as, the, as the New Testament says, he was at the breast of our Lord. So another important aspect of understanding the Eucharist is what a memorial meant, what a, or what a memorial means to the Jews. You know, you know, Jesus says, "Do this in memory or in memorial of me." And then, for, so what a memorial meant for the Jews is, as we'll see from Saint Paul, it's, it means something more of like a participation in something. So if you were at, yeah, all of you guys were awesome at being at the presentation. Doctor Sri, I believe, made the point that. Uh, uh, like for example, the the Passover is a is, you know, perfect uh, parallel. That you know when the Jews uh, celebrate the Passover, they understood it as a spiritual participation, you know, an, an extension of what happened, you know, because they, them being you know a, a, a family people, a nationalistic people, you know, it's for their ancestors to come have come out of Egypt. You know, in a way, it's like bringing them out as well. So their participation in the Passover, they understood as you know, participation in that historical event, in a manner of speaking. And the same thing with the Eucharist. So, uh, St. Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, he says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation? And that's a very strong word, you know, participation in the blood of Christ. Uh, the bread that we break is not a participation in the body of Christ. Because the loaf we break is one, we, though many, are one body. And then, of course, he really develops this in his one body with the body of Christ in chapter 12. But he says, We, though many, are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. Look at Israel according to the flesh. Are not those who eat the sacrifices participants in the altar? So, you know, there, there was, was that, you know, putting their sins on those sacrifices. You know, they were, you know, they were unloading their sins on those calves and bulls and lambs and whatnot. <coughs> So uh, another aspect in understanding the Eucharist is really uh, under getting to, getting into the understanding what the Passover was all about. 
And the celebration of Passover was uh, organized around four cups, four cups of wine, that is, you know, to kind of uh, understand that kind of also that celebratory nature of it, that, you know, wine was very much a sign of celebration. And so you have the, the, the four cups of the Passover, and uh, this is a really uh, well, uh, famous talk by uh, Scott Hahn, who Nathan is well, probably well familiar with, uh, understanding the uh, four cups. Uh, there's the cup of sanctification, cup of forgiveness, cup of blessing, and the cup of acceptance. And then at the end of the Passover, the host will proclaim tel, tel tesses, Telesti, or which means it is finished, and that has very, um, very much significance. Of course, if you, you know you know your gospels. That's what Jesus said at the end: "It is finished." So the kind of the parallel uh, in the gospels in their own Passover, uh, if you if you're kind of analyzing it, you'll realize that they only drank three cups. After which, then they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then uh, Jesus says. Let this cup pass before me. Well, if you're if you're not familiar with Jewish culture and heritage, you know you don't know well, what does he tell him. Let this cup pass before me. He's referring to the fourth cup, which is again the cup of acceptance. But he gives the oh, but then he also gives right before they go out. He gives the he he kind of alters the Passover, and when he lifts up the cup of blessing, and this kind of very much you know kind of harkens back to you know the promise to Abraham that, that major. Major main promise, you know, the big covenant with Abraham he says, your descendant will be a blessing to all nations. And so with the cup of blessing, you know, that, you know, so Abraham and then his descendants later had the, later, you know, so, uh, did the, had, went through the Exodus and you were given these four cups to, you know, practice. And then, so it was with that cup of blessing that Christ united to his own, you know, the blood of, of my, of the new covenant. And so it's the cup of acceptance, which of course, you know, is the acceptance of his death. So when he's hanging on the cross, you know, the, he's offered that wine or, you know, that's uh, on the, the hyssop branch, which uh, in, the, in the Exodus you know, story, the, the blood was smeared on the uh, door frames with a hyssop branch. And so it was offered up to him in that respect, in that way, you know, kind of finally bringing his, his cup to him, his cup of consummation or cup of acceptance uh, and then at the end after he takes the cup of acceptance after he accepts his you know sacrificial death he says it is finished so uh, another important aspect that comes from Luke's gospel in understanding the Eucharist uh, Jesus himself, it says, Jesus drew near the disciples who were walking along the road and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped looking downcast. He said to them, was not it necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread and said the blessing and broke it and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the, the scriptures to us? So here we find Christ revealing himself to, to his disciples, that revelation in the breaking of the bread, you know. That's when they finally saw him. And so in, when we kind of analyze what, what, kind of what happened there, you know, uh, we have both aspects of you know the liturgy. You have the uh, he's opening the scriptures to them, which is what we do. You know the first half of mass, we we discuss you know the Old Testament prophecies that refer to Christ, and then the New Testament teaching. You know we open up the, you know what the apostles taught, and then we, in the second half, you know he does he, he breaks bread with them, which is you know the second half of the liturgy, as it will be a future talk is you know the second is the liturgy of the Eucharist, the break or the bread. So then just to kind of continuing from, so basically moving from the Gospels, what was given, you know, to the Apostles, <clears throat> and starting to historically move forward, the church in the book of Acts basically uh, does the exact same thing. It says after people were baptized, they would uh, 
devote themselves to the teachings of the apostles, you know, with the teaching of the apostles being, you know, you know, they would teach from scripture all these prophetic uh, allusions to Christ, just as the, the the two on the road to Emmaus, you know, they were taught that same, you know, type of form of interpretation. And then the breaking the bread and the prayers. <clears throat> and then they, it goes on to say that they share all things in common. Basically, you know, emphasizing our our uh, our uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Our mission of stewardship. You know, our what we you know our, to share with our brothers and sisters. You know, sharing with those in needs. You know, so let's uh, kind of focus in on Saint Paul's teaching. <clears throat> so uh, so we saw in First uh, Corinthians ten where uh, St. Paul makes the emphasis that the uh, partaking in the Eucharist is a participation. You know, we emphasize that. So that was in chapter 10. In chapter 10. In chapter 11, he there goes on to make the point that for as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and blood of the Lord. A person should examine examine himself so, so eating the bread and drinking the cup before eating the bread and drinking the cup. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So some people, you know, they'll make the emphasis the point that, you know, if it was just a symbol as we talked about earlier, you know, how can you really be, you know, being conflict uh, convicted of the body and blood of the Lord if it's just a symbolic thing? You know, what are you really discerning but a symbol? So it's kind of inconsistent. Uh, the image of heavenly worship, this is from the book of Revelations. Just a couple, just to kind of skim through it, just the, you know, the highlights of this passage in uh, Revelation 5. You know, it says uh, that a lamb that was, he sees a lamb that was seen to have been slain, you know, referring to Christ. There was harp or music, you know, like, you know, we're our, or today we'd say uh, an organ. <laughs> Incense, you know, for what they, you know, what we refer to as high masses, they still do incense. The prayer, you know, of course, uh, and then the, you know, he says, "You made them a kingdom of priests," you know, kind of like I said before, reopening the priesthood up. And then the great amen, you know, if you're familiar with mass, uh, this is a, a very oh, I was going to bring it tonight too. I forgot. Uh, a very good book of uh, Dr. Scott Hahn. Is, uh, it's called The Lamb's Supper. It's really kind of what made him famous, his book, The Lamb's Supper. For him, it was kind of a, you know, it was a discovery, you know, in his own historical studies, but really it was a, a, it was a, a recovery for his, you know, for his own personal Protestant faith of, of recovering this interpretation of the book of Revelation in its, in its very liturgical, you know, aspects of, of Revelation. <clears throat> So this is just, you know, this is just focusing on chapter 5. You know, he really unpacks, like, all of Revelation. And it's, so I'd, I'd recommend, I have it if you want, so you can borrow it from me. But I'd recommend it. It's a good read. It's not very long. It's like 180 pages. The Eucharist and Theosis. Now this is where we really get to the heart of it. Like I mentioned before, Theosis is what we're building towards. So this is the greatest point to grasp. As individuals, we, we, you know, we say we become one with Christ. But, you know, what does that mean or how, how does that happen? And we become, and we say we become members of the body of Christ. And this is by theosis, which is the process of Christ transforming the, what grace actually does to us. You know, how it makes us one. You know, how, you remember at the beginning I had those little stick figures, how, you know, how they are healed, how they are healed in Christ by being fully God and fully human. You know, you know healing those, those aspects, you know, of our, of our body and soul. So God has bestowed on us precious Oh, this is from Second Peter, and this is kind of the, the, the understanding of what, what theosis is, is being, becoming partakers of the divine nature. As St. Peter says, God has bestowed on us the precious and very great promises so that through them you may come to share the divine nature after escaping from the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. So that's where, you know, one of the points, you know, in those we'll talk about later in the different class on grace. And that's where we very much, you know, diverge from our Protestant brothers and sisters, or some of them, I should say. You know, especially, you know, your more evangelical Protestantism, the more common, uh, is this understanding of what grace is, you know. So, you know, so to be partakers of the divine nature, you know, the, the, the sacraments, you know, we believe that the sacraments are actually do something. You know, they're not just mere symbols. Not, not one of them are mere symbols. You know? 
to actually do something to the human soul, like baptism. You know, many say baptism is a symbol also. No, you know, we believe that baptism actually cleanses. These are all just symbols. You know, really, what's the point? What's it, what's it doing to us? You know, of course, they'll say, you know, because we're, we're saved by faith. But as Catholics, we'd say, we're saved more by faith. We're saved by transformation, if you will. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a much richer and deeper understanding of grace and how grace comes to us in the sacraments. Especially, of course, as I said, you know, especially the Eucharist being the source and summit of our faith. So the Eucharist in the early church, and here's just, uh, this is where your handout comes in. And this is, this is, this is an abridged version. This the, the, what I pulled off of the internet was from Catholic Answers. They had like, it was like four pages long, like the first 400 years of like really, really uh, strong quotes from the early church fathers. But of course, you know, you know, that, that's, you know, the point is really the first, the first several, you know, starting with, you know, like Ignatius of Antioch. He was, again, significant because he was a sucks disciple of the Apostle John. And so, you know, being a disciple of the one who actually wrote John 6. And what he says about the Eucharist, we know it's not symbolic. He says it's the true body and blood of our Lord who was crucified. So, you know, so if a disciple of the Apostles is getting that wrong, then what hope do we have, you know? So, but, you know, he really, he illustrates in his, in his writings that literal understanding of what the Eucharist was. And then from the him forward, you know, you know, I give several. I, I think give to the first 250 years of, you know, quotes from early, you know, really significant early church fathers. You know, their understanding that the Eucharist was literal and a sacrifice united to the sacrifice of the cross. So, then, so then I kind of wanted to, you know, kind of focus this on, focus in on why have people lost faith in the Eucharist, which you know obviously started. You know, I said the, you know, the uh, belief in the real presence was. You know, strong and universal for the first thousand years until Berengarius of Tours, but it really, but he was reconciled to the church. You know, the church with one of the councils, I think the one of the Lateran councils. You know, he was reconciled. You know, when the church gave a definitive teaching uh, on transubstantiation. So from him forward, for the next couple of years, it was again an uncontested doctrine of the, of the you know of the Christian faith. You know, core doctrine until the Reformation. While as we discussed in our you know class on. When I discussed the church and kind of went through church history briefly, you know, the Reformation is a very wild and confusing thing with all these different breaks, all these different dudes, as I illustrated at the beginning, you know, giving their own teachings on the Eucharist, you know. Zwingli says it's only a symbol. Uh, Luther said it was, you know, Christ was present alongside the elements. Uh, uh, Calvin said it was, you know, Christ was present only for those who, the, the elect who believed. And so, you know, this, you know, Pick your pick your pope, you know, as you know we say, as you know, when you become a, you know, when you divide from the church, you know, your own basing on your own interpretation. And the saying is, you know, everybody becomes his own pope, you know. So back then, you know, it's like pick your leader, your, who you want to, who you best, who resonates with you or whatever. But so it's a very confusing time. So, uh, so since so so, but my point being is that you know, so when you start dividing from the church, and this is why I really wanted to emphasize the Eucharist. Uh, early in in conjunction with what the church is, because when we understand, you know, the church, and when we understand who Jesus Christ is and what he what he did, being God and man, healing us and healing us through the Eucharist, you know, then we can have a, a better, you know, a, a better ecclesiology, a better understanding of what the church is, you know, in its mystical form. So, 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 you know, when people start breaking from the church, you know, you you lose an appreciation for what the church is, you know. You know, people, you know, you know, as Catholics, we believe, you know, because of the Eucharist, we are substantially united to Jesus Christ, you know, as he comes into us and transforms our soul. And then we become, as I made that quote, you know, it's the, the body of Christ in the Eucharist that makes the church the body of Christ. And so when you lose faith in the church, you're going to naturally lose faith in what the Eucharist is, you know, because the church, like I said towards the beginning, you know, the church is like, ecclesiology is like, like the heart of theology, because you know it's the church that explains everything for us. You know, sure, you know Jesus Christ is the foundation of our faith, but unless you have a good understanding of the church is, you know, you're gonna you're gonna be swept away by every wind of doctrine, as the New Testament says. You know, you don't have that firm foundation. You know, that's so. You know, the church is like the rock on the rock. You know, it's that kind of you know to help us be to remain stable in our faith. 
So you're losing faith in the church, you know, kind of naturally leads to losing faith in the Eucharist. So what does this mean for us? To kind of come to a wrap up here. We are given the opportunity at every Mass to receive this blessing of grace and to, be, to receive this transformation. You know, so, so if, you know, you know, God forbid you stop, but this is like, to me, in my mind, the last couple talks on the church and Jesus Christ and especially now to the Eucharist, you're good. You know, this is, this is the heart of it, you know. So, and this is, you know, this is why you're here, basically, to prepare yourself to receive Jesus Christ. So, I should have more trouble. So this is the heart of the faith. So, you know, this, this is why we're all here. This is why, you know, before I gave that statistic that a lot of Catholics fall away, you know, I had a good, I had a good catechesis, you know, and I hope that you guys are getting a good one as well so that you don't fall away, you know, after just a couple years because this is why we're here. It's for the Eucharist, for, for actually, for Jesus Christ. You know, all Christians say, you know, we're, you know, we believe in Jesus Christ and that's, he's the foundation. But we believe in him in a very unique and special way in a very powerful way. And so another important, so, the, so in, in we encounter our Lord Jesus Christ at every Mass, and which, so by at every Mass, we are given the opportunity to receive our Lord, but in, the, in a reciprocal form, at every Mass, we give Jesus Christ the opportunity to come into us and to heal us. And then we become participants as, you know, the book of Revelation, you know, kind of gave that liturgical kind of uh, vision of what, you know, the Mass is. We are, you know, entered into that, that heavenly worship of God. The end. I wrapped that one up a little bit quicker than I thought I was going to do. That's good. So we'll open it up to discussion questions. Did it go off? Okay.